channels all set up and everything. That's cool. Yes, sir. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to our very first live session together. I am super excited. I uh, I can't even put to words like how excited I am to do this because Vance and I have been talking about a way to collaborate and do some stuff consistently. Um, and finally, oh man, I, I hear myself echoing. There it is, cool. Um, yeah, so what we're doing is we're gonna be finding properties live using Privy. Just to give you guys a little bit of a background on myself and then Benson, I'd love for you to go into. Um, this is my seventh year in real estate. So I started off as a traditional real estate agent and found the investment world through, I'm sure like what a lot of you guys have done too, it's through YouTube, through different communities in the space. And the thing that really got me excited was to be able to understand that there's an easier way to do this business. Um, from being just a traditional real estate agent and having to rely on a client to be able to buy and sell properties to then switching to the investment side. And you guys will hear me say this infamous catchphrase a few times that the hardest part of being an agent is to find a client. The hardest part of being an investor is to find the deal. So the beauty of what we do here with Privy is that we are able to eliminate the fact the hardest part of finding the deal is that it's on market. A lot of people have limiting beliefs of people buying them on market or even if there is deals on market and we're here to squash that, provide some value and also just show you guys that you guys can do this too. So we are going to be uh, going live every single Wednesday. I would love for Benson to kind of give a little bit of a brief interview or introduction for himself and talk about Privy and then we'll jump right into it. Awesome, well you guys, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm Benson Juarez, if you haven't uh, met me before, I'm one of the owners here at Privy. And uh, I'm super stoked to be doing this with uh, Ryan as well because he, uh, in my mind, he is like my my younger brother <laughs> and uh just to see him like kind of thrive and grow over the you know the, the time that i've known him has been absolutely amazing and you know knowing his story it should be inspirational to all of you because you know ryan is you like ryan is uh, a, a guy who's gone in and hacked and figured it out and now has assembled an amazing team but he had to get proof of concept first right so he had to go out and he had to prove it before he scaled it and he's done that. And so you should really take his story as inspiration and also as a guide on what to do. And you can also use the things that he has done in his time as things maybe not to do because, you know, we all make mistakes and, you know, you can use his, his um, advice as a way to avoid, you know, pitfalls, you know, investing money into, you know, expensive, you know, campaigns and approaches that are unproven. And you can really use this this uh, strategy that we're going to show you as a way to find low hanging fruit. Um, a lot of people, when they first start off in the business, they get convinced they have to go out and spend a bunch of money on expensive marketing campaigns, and they have to go and spend a bunch of money on um, you know expensive tools and lists, and before they even really know what they're doing, right? Right. And so, part of what we're going to talk about is how you can get started in the business and and learn the multiple sides because there's lead gen and then there's knowing what a deal even looks like. You can be the best salesperson. You could have, you know, a marketing background. You could know pay-per-click and you could know how to generate leads, all these other ways. But if, if, if leads are coming in and you don't know what, how to identify a deal, if you don't know how to run comps, you don't know what a deal is in your market versus Philadelphia versus Tampa versus Denver, it's different everywhere. You those that money you might as well just go pour it down the toilet. Like that's how important it is for you to understand the real estate side of the business, which is is part of what we're going to show you guys. It's like how to understand what a deal looks like, how to understand your as is value, your after repair value, and take that information and make it actionable. So you actually feel confident writing an offer and knowing that if you can get it under contract, that you have a plan. And what to do with it after the fact, right? If it's a wholesale deal, it's disposition. If it's a fix and flip, um, it's going to be, you know, you going and getting your, your, your loan set up and doing the next steps. Uh, if you're an agent, well, maybe you're finding stuff for your clients. Like they, they better have their ducks in a row so you can actually get that thing to closing and then they can take that property out and actually make money on it. Because as an agent, if you give bad advice and you get somebody into a bad deal where the numbers don't make sense, well, they're not going to use you again. And this is a small community. So you wanna make sure that you're, you guys have all your, your things buttoned up, you're crossing your T's dot in your eyes. And that's whether you're an agent, wholesaler, fix and flipper, creative deal structure, all of it. 
And Benson, just a little bit of background on Privy. Um, how did this all come together? Was it just, were you doing this business or are you a tech guy background? Like just so everyone can kind of understand um, from where you were to how you got to this point. Uh, well, it, it's, it is a long story, but um, my business partner, Scott Fall and I were in the same real estate office and, you know, as agents and investors ourselves, we were facing many of the problems that you guys are facing today. And so what we realized is that there's only so much you can do manually. And the MLS on its own, it's just not an effective tool for even just comping. Like it's not designed for comping. It's a still a very manual process. And then to be able to add in automation to where you can filter through, like say there's a hundred new properties that were on the market. Well, we'd have to go in and analyze a hundred properties to find the five that are actually viable deals. So we're basically spending 95% of our time running comps, analyze deals that we're going to say no to anyway. Yep. So that time is just going down the drain. So with automation, you can basically run an algorithm that comps all the properties out in a fraction of a second. And then you eliminate 95% of the properties that are not deals. And then you can spend your time on the five that are. And maybe you look at those five a little bit more closely and maybe one of them um, we flagged as a deal because you know, it is, um, you know, the comps have an ocean view and yours doesn't, right? And so maybe that one's not a deal because of something simple like that. But there's always going to be an element of the person, you, me, our, our viewers, where you have to look at it with your own two eyes. Real estate is going to be a business. And, and the, the whole Zillow story with the Zestimate and the iBuyer program is, is a perfect kind of, of use case or, or white paper on, if you try to automate everything in this business, you're going to fail. And that's why their iBuyer program failed because they were basing all of their buying decisions on their Zestimate, which they're a billion dollar company, right? And they have this um, automated valuation model is what is called an AVM. That's what their Zestimate is. And a lot of people still use those. They, they tell you, and I don't know what the number is today, but at some point it was like 20 to 30% off in either direction. Well, we're in a, a business where if you're 5% off in either direction, the data is basically unusable. So they were making buying decisions. They were buying millions and millions of dollars in property based off of a, a flawed approach that was 100% automated. So you, you, as much as we can give you automation, you still have to understand what a deal is because you're going to make the, the ultimate decision on whether or not to pull the trigger. Absolutely. And I love that. I think it's really important for everyone to understand that you have done this business too. It's not like you were just on the tech side. Um, we've tried to partner in the past with different softwares and stuff. And what I always found is there's a serious disconnect. And the one thing that I want you guys to understand about this show is that this is going to be perfectly imperfect. There is nothing here that's scripted. There is nothing here that we have as a plan. We are going to be going with the flow to show you guys exactly how we can do this on the fly, but also too, so you guys can give us feedback. At the end of the day, just like anything that you'll hear in life, but more specifically what I always emphasize to real estate is what you put into this is what you're going to get out of it. So if you put in part-time effort, you might get lucky if it pays you part-time. If you put in full-time effort, you'll question why nine to five exists. So in this, during we go, during this, while we go live, I want you guys to be able to, to put questions, um, obviously try to keep it to agent related or on market deals. But if you guys have questions to anything in real estate, um, the one thing I always tell my students too, is that if I don't have the answer, if Benson doesn't have the answer, we are fortunate that we are in a lot of different groups to where we can generally get the answer pretty quickly. Um, and also we can always bring on guests too. Throughout this time though, um, if you guys find things in Privy or um, glitches or system issues, whatever, just let us know. And the one thing I can attest to with Benson is that anything I've always brought to feedback, he is the quickest to getting it implemented and corrected inside the system. Um, so at the end of the day, what you guys can offer is feedback. Obviously it'll make this show better and the software better as well. Uh, with that said, I want to put you guys on the spot that are all watching and listening to this live. What market do you guys want to see today? That's literally to show you guys how live this is going to be. Let's go ahead and share the screen. Um, Benson, do you want to share yours or do you want me to share mine? Um, go ahead and share yours. Let's do it. Share screen. And one of the things I want to do so that we can get a better, give people a better understanding of, um, you know, what we're covering here is we want we want to make sure that if you're going to have the most success using this strategy, there's a few things that you want to do yep. to get the best possible outcome. Number one, you want to make sure you're in a high investor activity area. That's where all of, at the top there where it says fix and flip. 
that is going to make sure that you are, how are in an area where the ingredients are for you to basically to assemble a deal. The yep. next thing is, is you want to do your best to be in a, in a direct to MLS area. So wherever you see blue on the map is where we've got direct to MLS data contracts. That's where you're going to have the most up to date, the most accurate with price changes, status changes, uh, comping, doing, comps doing the same thing, yep. uh, rich photos, property descriptions, agent information, um, all in one place. If you want to go do deals in Montana, you can still do deals there. It's just not going to be as easy. And you probably wouldn't want to go there anyway because there's no investor activity there. Right. And so the ingredients to build a deal aren't present there. So target a high investor activity area. Do your best for that to be in a, in a direct to MLS area. If that's not mm -hmm. where you live, you, people are so stuck, Ryan, on this my market idea. Mm -hmm. yep. My market, you guys, is going to cause you to fail 100%. Because my market, meaning your market, probably there's a good chance that area is not in a high investor activity area. So high investor activity area takes precedence before the direct to MLS. And then finally, the last piece where the my market might fall in mm -hmm. is where you actually live. Right. If my market is where you actually live. And that's and that's how you choose that. Well, that's the that's the last thing you use as a determiner on where you go, where you live or where you want to look for deals is not one or two. Number one is high investor activity. Number two is direct to MLS. Number three is you can be your own boots on the ground. If you can be your own boots on the ground, it'll help you. But I will tell you what, we've got several users who used to, to think, oh, my God, I have to be looking for deals where I live, when they figured out that they could actually do deals right from their computer and they didn't have to go drive and look at properties, they didn't have to go and look at houses, it was just wasting their time. It was actually liberating and they were actually able to get w way more offers out. And this is a right. volume play, right, Ryan? I mean, you talk about doing five to 10 offers a day. Right. You can't do five to 10 offers a day if you're driving around looking at houses. 100%. You can't do it. 100%. So you looking for deals in my market is going to hold you back. It's actually more of, of a deterrent um, and a hindrance for you than it is a, a positive. But I do understand that many of you, it makes you feel comfortable and warm and fuzzy. If you can get outside of that and you know that the data is king and whether or not you look at it with your own two eyes is going to be a factor, it'll open up the world to you. And then you can target the best areas to invest, not just compromise and look where you live because it's convenient. Absolutely. And we've got so many comments popping in here of different markets. Uh, make sure to keep throwing the um, what market you guys want to see. We will go through a couple of them if we've got some time. Um, and also to every week, my goal here on this show is to basically go and really just show you guys the ropes. So it's truly understanding the process and not just being able to identify a deal, but the what happens next, right? Like it's always easy to talk about how we can all identify deals and what offers we're going to go and submit on properties. But at the end of the day, if we don't talk about the actual nitty gritty stuff as to what you need to do to make sure a deal goes and gets closed, we're just wasting time here. And at the end of the day, this is all about being productive, but more importantly, being efficient. So what I want to make sure you guys understand is first off, we have to find the buyers first. So while Benson's saying the investor activity, I want you guys to really understand this software is the best because of how simple it is to use. So when we're talking about fix and flip, for example, we're going to say that these are investors that have gone in and fixed and flipped properties. I think that's pretty self-explanatory, but the most important piece to that isn't just to know who's buying the properties, it's to know who the buyers are. We want to be able to build the relationships with them. And also there's a two parts of this. One, it's building the relationships with the buyers that are going out and actually buying these properties. But two, this is what I love. This is the agent investors method. Build the relationship with the agent, understanding that while the hardest part of being the agent is to find a client, what exactly do I mean by that? If the hardest part for the agent is to go and find a client, that's somebody that is willing to go and buy and sell a property without actually blowing it up, without actually not qualifying, without actually wanting to like go and make this the hardest part of your entire job. The hardest part for the agent is to actually find the client, but then it's also to deal with them. So if you have an agent that has an investor client, do you think the odds are that they only have one investor client? Because I don't. I think that they probably have 5, 10, 15, 20. I think they might have a brokerage. I think they might be a part of a team that specializes with working with investors. So calling that agent could really open up the floodgate to 15 different investor relationships. So with that said, we're seeing a bunch of comments pop in. Um, 
I am going to be a little biased. I had somebody in my Discord throw some markets out there too, um, and they were recommending some of the smaller markets. Again, this is on the fly. Benson, do you have any of the smaller Midwest markets that you'd want to pick today? Um, somebody put up Cleveland. Somebody put up uh, Milwaukee. Let's do, Let's do it. Those are two markets that I, I, I'm very interested in. Both of them have direct to MLS. Both of them have – they're not smaller markets, but I would call them mid-level markets. They're not like the highest. Okay. Cleveland, they're not Ohio. the lowest either. Let's do Cleveland then. So clicking on Cleveland, this button right here is special, the fix and flip, because this is going to dictate which properties have been bought and flipped by an investor. So now we see all these different circles. These are going to be where the deals are getting done at the current moment in time. So obviously, like if you see three right here, you're not going to want to go click on the three. You're not going to go click on the two. We're going to want to click on 94, 91, 119, um, even 54. Benson, I'm not as familiar with the Midwest um, up outside of Illinois. What would yeah. you recommend, 119 well, or 94? Well, what I would do first is if you go into the filter yep. and then click the button underneath where it says Cleveland, it says include surrounding areas. Okay. That will include properties and then click run search. That'll include properties that are just outside the city boundaries. Ooh. So we have more of a kind of an overall look. And then now we can see some different numbers here. So it gives us a better sense because it, Love that. when you put the city, it actually includes just the city boundaries. Um, so yeah. what I, I would do the 135. Yeah, I think that one's the one. Look at all of these properties. And now Benson, these are all properties that have been bought and flipped by investors. They are, right? So what we know, I mean, being data guys, is there no, there's no data out there that will tell you that a house is flipped. You have to basically infer based off of what's out there. So we look for a house that was bought, fixed up, mm -hmm. and sold, and they bought it lower than 75% of the ARV. And that was because we had that in our filters, right? Right up here? Yeah, but so if you open up that filter there, it, you can adjust this up or down. But this isn't a scenario, you guys, where you want to lower it to try to find properties that were purchased lower. This is to, to try to find who the buyers are and then where the, your comps located. Mm -hmm. Because if you are in, you know, we saw those other areas that have low investor activity. Um, yeah. Some of them are like, um, you know, Montana and some of these, you know, northern states. You could be the best marketer in the world. And if you come across a property that's, that's unrenovated and there's no renovated comps around it, the only way you can make that property to be a deal is to offer something so ridiculously low that there's no chance of them accepting it. Right. But you could find a house that's unrenovated and you could pay retail for it as long as it's right next door or in the same neighborhood as a renovated home. So you want to be looking for houses in renovated areas. That's how you determine ARV, right? It, it sounds elementary to be like, oh, ARV means you have to compare your house to a renovated home. But there are people out there that are trying to prove after repair value with unrenovated homes every single day mm -hmm. because they're not targeting high investor activity areas. They're just looking for deals based off of convenience. They're looking where they live or where they work or they find some property on Facebook and then they just go run a bunch of comps on it and they can't figure out what it's worth because they weren't strategic about where they were looking in the first place. So don't even evaluate any property if you want, if you value your time that's not in a high investor activity area. Absolutely. And so there's a lot of different options here for us to pick from. Um, do we just click on one of the higher numbers again, or what do we do next? Yeah, you, you can zoom in. I don't know if you have a roller ball. It'll yeah. just take you in a notch there, and then you can get in. Once the properties get below, um, once it gets below 300, then it'll break up like this. Okay. And then look on the left, look at one that looks like it's renovated. That one that doesn't look like it is. Now, that one that's 18,000, yeah. there's a reason why it shows there. It's probably not a flip, but they bought it recently yep. and they bought it lower than 75%. And so that yeah. maybe they got it at, from an auction for like two grand or something. Like those, those will happen. For sure. And I, yeah, I think we'll, we'll skip over this one, but just to that point, you click on this, we'll be able to see who the buyer was, meaning that if we know someone paid $18,000 for this house, the odds of them going and buying another property that's super discounted are very high. So right. now let's just check out maybe this one. This one looks like it might be some fresh paint. No? Maybe. Let's take, let's take a look. Looks like this one was also sold on January 20th, 2023. So we know it's new. We only have that one photo, but based on this, um, there we go. Cleaned up. It's 
might be a little bit more of a wholesale where they went in, they just uh, cleaned up the property, painted the walls, put in some new baseboards, kept the original floors. Looks mm -hmm. like they painted cabinets in the kitchen. This is what I would assume to be a um, Midwest flip aside from hotel. This. Yeah. So they bought it for 43 grand there. So see the 54%. So below there in blue, you can see that they bought it at 54%. So they bought it for 43 grand. Yep. Maybe just went in there and cleaned it up. Right. And then sold it for 80. So that was 54% of the ARV. So mm -hmm. this could have been, is it a flip? You know, like what we consider in a traditional sense? No, but they did buy it and then sold it shortly thereafter and made a profit. Right. Absolutely. And the beauty of this too, is that we can see comparables. We can see all the data that you can see on the MLS. And more importantly, this is what I want you guys to understand. You can see the agent's information. So um, for those of you that have just the investor one, you guys can't see the agents. You can just take their first name and last name and their listing brokerage, which is up here. Right. And you could just Google it. And I promise you it'll pop up. Agents remembering that the hardest part for them is to find the client. Their information is not hard to find. You're not skip tracing this. You're not paying for it. You're able to go and just pull this list or pull this information specific to the agent just by Googling. So yeah, you would just want to Google that again. You can only see the agent contact information in our system right now if you're yeah. licensed. Correct. And so, I mean, right here, you could see like just to compare notes of it. Um, where was it? It was Miller 216-402-6776. That's just off of Google. Yeah. That's how simple this is. Um, now, the most important piece that I want you guys to understand is that we see a buyer agent and we see a seller's agent. For those of you that are in my Agent Investors Diamonds here program, got to see me make a quick little fumble yesterday, or it was uh, last week when we were calling because I accidentally called the buyer's agent looking for uh, the listing agent. And it was um, funny because they ended up, or I might have had that backwards because they told me the one that didn't answer was actually the one that was the contractor, the investor, and the flipper that was going in to go and try to buy more properties. So no, by one didn't. not answering the phone, I actually got the information I needed from the other agent. So just understand that you see all this right here, you can go and contact both. So when you go and call Sharitha Miller, you would say, hey, I see this house was just renovated. Did you represent the investor or did you flip it yourself? Because yeah. if they say, oh, I flipped it myself, awesome. Well, it looks like you just sold this one. Would you be interested in buying another one? The whole key and part of this is to understand that you have to go find your buyer first. The minute you find your buyer, you can reverse engineer the process of understanding what exactly it is that that buyer relationship is looking for. So you're not on a scavenger hunt trying to find something that you don't even know what you're looking for. I mean, at the end of the day, when real estate investing is finding a needle in a haystack, it's at least good to know that you're looking for a needle. A lot of times if you have a haystack and you don't know what you're looking for, it's going to be a long day. So mm -hmm. um, first off, I would call the listing agent first, call and introduce yourself and say, hey, I saw you just flipped this property. Are you looking to buy more? I'm a real estate investor out in this area as well. And I come across a lot of opportunities. And I was wondering if you'd be interested in, in purchasing another. The second piece to this is reaching out to the buyer's agent. Yeah, is Ryan, this... if I can show you too, if you scroll Please. down to the before and after, yep, because they won't see that section you're looking at. Yep. Um, so this, they actually bought this from public record. It looks like, unless I missed something there. It, it definitely um, is a public record. This is going to be from a Google image. Right. And if there was, if there was an on market acquisition, it would have the MLS ID here, but over to the right, it shows the listing agent. Um, and so when you guys are looking at this as, as an investor, this is where you're going to see the, both sides. Correct. Right. And then you can just Google it and, um, and below at the very, very bottom, you can see there, it, um, if you, without scrolling, it just kind of it sits at the bottom there. It's floating at the, at the bottom. It has the yeah. MLS ID and the agent yeah. that has actually caught, you know, you can highlight it and just right click and just click search Google. Um, mm -hmm. and it'll search that for you. Um, but it, I want to show you that you mentioned the comps. So this house, if you scroll up a little bit there, Ryan, into the comp section, see, we don't have any comps for this house. Yep. You know, you know why? why because there's no comps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so see, see how big that house is? It's 3,100 square feet or whatever. Yep. If you click the all activity checkbox below the map on the left, and this is something that we have baked in this, you guys, that actually removes the comping algorithm and it'll show you everything in the area, even if it's not a comp. Because sometimes you have to just figure out how to use the data that's available right. to decide value. 
because you might not find a, a one to one comparable. You might, the, the closest house to this, I mean, look at the square footage on those down below. Look how wildly different those all are. For sure. I mean, we've They're got ours is, ours is 3,100. We've got 2,500. We've got 26 or 2,500. We have 1,600, 728, 1,680. We've got one that's 4,200 square feet, but look at the price of that thing. Yeah, it's not a comp, right? Not so this comp. is why we didn't show comps to start. We actually are um, just finished beta testing a, uh, a comp adjuster. Um, I think that'll be live here in a few days where you'll actually be able to go in and say, okay, instead of a 15% tolerance in the square feet, we want to use 20 now or 25. And we want to go out uh, two miles because we're in farmland and the closest house is a mile away. So we need to expand out and look two miles. Um, all right. that's coming down the pipe. For sure. For sure. And this, I mean, this is the beautiful thing about this. This is what I feel like the agents don't realize is typically the most important tool they have on their tool belt. It's the MLS access for investors. If you're not licensed, having a software like Privy is almost just as good, if not better. A lot of the feedback that we get from people that aren't even licensed agents in our program is they say they prefer the, the layout, the user interface of Privy versus the MLS. Most MLS softwares are actually looking like they were made in the 1990s before the internet was really even a thing. Privy has everything color coded, broken down, has little buttons. The hardest part sometimes is just knowing how to use the software. And every day, just to show you guys, I'm still learning too. So that's the beauty of having Benson on is that he's able to break some things down for us and um, make it easy for us to follow. But then more importantly, let's take some action. So. Oh, yeah. So let's let's find a, like, a, like a true flip. If you could just go and scroll down a little bit and you may find like that one. The 159 one might be a flip. So you know, it looks it. like that's a good photo there. There we go. Yes, sir. Right. Again, we're inferring you guys because we're just looking for two transactions in a short period of time. The There's no way for us to look at these photos algorithmically and be like, oh, yeah, that's a flip. Look at this. So we could see who it was sold by. This was definitely a flip. And typically I don't recommend going through the photos first, but in this case too, I want to show you guys that this is super important. Look at these lovely photos. Oh yeah. Professional photographer there. This is with like a flip phone. <laughs> um, and then you can see the beautiful, nice remodeled. Uh, we got LVP. It looks like flooring might be tile, um, new cabinets, stainless steel appliances, new paints, baseboards. Beautiful. This is exactly what you're looking for to be able to see this property is renovated. Now from there, Benson, we could see the before and after. Should we go to the comparables next? Well, I want to look at the numbers real quick there. Look at that 27% okay. of the ARV. Crazy. This, you guys, this was an on-market deal. Remember earlier I mentioned how people are, are banging their heads against the wall, spending all kinds of money, searching for motivated sellers? Well, the most motivated sellers in the country are people who put their properties up for sale. They already decided to sell it. Yep. Then at that point, the only thing that matters is, can you find a house that's a deal? Well, a deal, like we said, is when you find a house in the same neighborhood as a fix and flip. Mm -hmm. But look at this. They bought this thing for 27% of the ARV. I know people that are buying stuff off market. I bet you we could find somebody in, in this market that does. We won't spend that today. Yep. It's probably paying 50, 60% of the ARV, more than twice as much as this person that had to do zero marketing yep. to find this property. They got it under contract, closed it, and they grossed 119,000 or whatever that is. 116,400. It's insane. Insane. And, and these are the kinds of properties we help you find using this systematic approach that Ryan's talking about here, where we can leverage data's algorithm to find these things, to pluck those needles out of the haystack. The algorithm will find these for you. It's Absolutely. amazing. So now let's go check out those comps see what we got around here. We didn't have to click on all activity, just goes right here and we could see what is around. But our property is 3612 Menlo Road. We are a three bedroom, two bathroom, 1348 square feet. Looks like we are a detached garage, one car garage. All right, well, what do we have around here? We've got one that is saying that it sold at 285,000 and that one is, where are we at at the 285? If I just click on it. It's the blue one. That one right there? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we can see this one is still relatively close. So I like that. The only thing that I would make a note, which I would put down in your guys' notes, if you are taking notes along this, I would say, okay, this does cross a major intersection. So is there anything over here that makes this more valuable than over here? 
I don't know the area, but in my case, I do like that we look like we are along the same road. So if we are along the same road over here, 285 and 159, all right, well, now we know this is our comparable. That's how we based the percentage in Benson. What percent of ARV this one sold at? Is this 56% is what this well, one was bond sold or break that down for us? Yeah, so this the one at 285 is going to be, it's a comp and it's sold for considerably higher than this other house. But the one we're looking at is already flipped, right? So right. that one is just for us to do our market research. Mm -hmm. No, I mean the one below, the subject property for on Menlo. Ours? Yeah. Right, so that one is is us Sorry understanding sold. what a deal is, yep. and then we can look at look at. There's even people that are selling them for even significantly higher than that. That's going to be a unique situation. I don't know why that sold for so much, right? Um, but it did. It's, that's what you call an outlier. So that one you would probably try not to use. Try, as, yeah, yep. But it's interesting to know that. But what you want to look at is the active ones. Correct. Is, so 99, 165, 70, 70, 89. So that's 71. If you could get that one that's active on the market, we know it's a comp of the one that just sold for 116, right? Because they're similar. Correct. So so could we get this at a price where we know the, the ARV is 116 and where the numbers make sense? I like Maybe. that. Maybe. Okay. So, and just to break this down for everyone too, because I want to make sure that everyone's following along here. So we go down and we can see that this one on Menlo, it sold at 160 and they bought it at what price again? They bought this one originally at, was it? It's on the before and after. And then... Let's go there. There it is. Right there. So they bought it for 43,000 and then they sold it for 160. So that means that we know that they're buying in the 40, 50K range with ease. And if this one's at 70K, now it's just a matter of making this one. Can we compare this property to 70,000 to the one that is three bedroom, two bathroom, 1300 square feet. So if this one's at 70,000 active listed 188 days ago, do we think that we could get this one lower? And this arrow pointing down means that they're doing price reductions. They're lowering the price from where it was. So Benson, should we click on this to take a further look at this property? Um, we could, but because what, we, what we, else should we do? Well, I was going to ask you too. Is this the one where we clicked all activity on to show all the houses? We, we did not. Nope. All activity oh, so is this not is, this is a true comp. Correct. So already we're seeing if it, we do 70 divided by 160, this is already below 50% of the ARV. This Correct. house that's at 70,000 is. Yep. Now, okay. is it exactly like ours? I'm not sure. And they just did a price reduction. So now they're going to be more motivated. Mm hmm. Um, so yeah, open it up and see if we can take a look at that. And maybe this is one where we could, we, we, we know that a similar house in the area was just fixed and flipped and sold for 160. Correct. And the biggest thing too, guys, feel free to ask questions in the chat if you guys have any, but right here, this was dropped $15,000 two days ago. So that means it was listed at 85,000. They just dropped it to 70. This is a property that I'd be calling on ASAP. Now going through the photos after seeing the data first, we can understand this property isn't in terrible condition, but it probably needs a little bit of TLC. This is something that I would go in and do just a little bit of a lipstick remodel on, but this isn't terrible. And if we have a comparable property that we just saw that was at 160,000 and this one's already at 70, do we think that the numbers can make sense here? It's a section eight tenant in place collecting 869 a month. This is already a cash flowing property for an investor with a very high cap rate. That's not a bad rental. Mm -hmm. So now we could go and we could see that this was, and I'm not going to show you guys this because this is, again, if you're an agent, but right here, Keller Williams Realty, Shaniqua Jackson. There you go. Just like that. Call this agent and I would say, hey, I want to introduce myself. I'm looking to buy some properties in the area. Um, I saw the one on 151st street. You guys just dropped the price. Um, I'm just interested uh, in knowing a little bit more about the property. Is there anything from the photos that I can't see that I should know about? If they can tell you more about the property condition, all they're doing is validating your price being a little bit lower in your offer one, but two, I'm genuinely asking, is there anything that I should know about? Because Unfortunately, the one thing that stuck to me photo wise is the shoes on the staircase. I'm not even kidding you. That's what my brain remembered. <laughs> so I'm going to go back over to show you guys to make sure I'm not crazy. 
I don't understand it, but whatever, it's all good. <laughs> this is not a property that I could see. Is there a water damage stain under the chair? Is there right. a roof leak from these photos? Is that window broken? I can't tell from your flip phone camera. Is there anything here that I need to know about that I can't see? If they can tell me any reason as to why this property has been sitting for 180 days that is going to justify the price not even being 70, if you get this property at 35,000, we just had another person that bought a property for 43,000. So that's a quick five, six, seven, eight thousand dollar assignment fee that you can turn around and get on a deal like this without trying that hard. The whole point of this today is to kind of go through an introductory with Privy, but then also too, so you guys can go back and we can reference this when we're going in as the following weeks pop up. I want to be able to go a little bit quicker. I want to start making calls for you guys. Today, I want to go through just kind of like a brief overview with the system. I'm not going to make any calls today, um, but we will start making calls with next week's show. Today, I'm going to give you guys the outline and what I'd be saying on these calls. So this one right here, is there anything I need to know about the property that I can't see through the photos? Oh, okay. It needs a new roof. Um, there is water damage under that chair. Sounds good. Um, I appreciate all that information. Is the seller looking to get rid of this property ASAP? Um, how long has the Section 8 tenant been in the property? Um, how long is the lease in place for? Are they 30-day um, rent to, uh, month to month? Because then if, that, if that's the case, I can give them a 30-day notice and then I can get a new tenant in. There's a lot of other things to unpack before I go in and start talking about price. Property condition, seller situation, price is the last thing I'm going to talk about because every other thing I mention should justify my price being lower than just the average 70 k where they want. Definitely. Yeah, I love it. I mean, this, we actually found this one through a process that I don't typically look for properties, but this is something that you mm -hmm. should consider when you guys are looking at sold houses, and you know, a house is just fixed and flipped. Just look around the area to see if there's anything else that's that's on market that you can buy because yep. they're already comps like the algorithm unless you've we checked that checkbox that's why i asked that earlier ryan yep. we hadn't un removed the algorithm so everything that we were looking at on that map was a comp correct and right here so if you see a house that flipped and you see active properties around them look at those prices and be like okay well what, what are the active prices around this house mm -hmm. that are for sale or under contract yep and see, well, are some of these actual deals? We didn't even run a deal finding algorithm yet, you guys, and we already found a potential deal. Like, how absolutely. crazy is that? That's one that I would absolutely be calling on 3717 East 151st Street, um, Cleveland, Ohio. I would not be offering full list price because remember, in a market like this, too, you're not going to be able to sell something at or above the list price. You're going to need it substantially lower. So, what I'd be going in and offering is depending on what the situation is with the Section 8 probably between 30 to 35,000, maybe at most 40, but be, be uh, aware here that we have a property comparable that sold at 160. So realistically, if someone's buying even at 50% of ARV, you should hypothetically have a buyer $80,000. Now, the other part of that too, just to kind of run some rough, rough numbers, they think they said 866 a month times by 12 is 10,392 a year. Divide that by even the price they want at 70,000, that's a 14.8% cap rate. So just to kind of put things relative, if you have buy and hold investors, this could be something if you have someone that is already working with Section 8 properties that they'd be very interested in going and purchasing probably pretty close to where it's already listed at. So, um, but I know, love what you said too. Is there a database of people who have Section 8 properties anywhere? Um, you know, I'm not sure if there is, but I wouldn't be surprised. I've got a few people in my community that do work with Section 8. So let me check on that and then I'll bring that back to uh, next week's I'd call. I'd be curious to know that. Like if you're looking for yeah. buyers, right? And you're looking to find a very specific kind of buyer, right? And you want to niche yourself because everybody's kind of targeting fix and flippers, right? A lot of people forget about landlords, right? Because landlords in general will pay a higher percentage of ARV than a flip, fix and flipper will because they don't need to realize their gains as soon as they acquire the property and, and you know, renovate it, right? They're thinking, okay, yeah, if I can get it at a discount, five, 10%, 20%, if they're going to, they're looking to increase the value a little bit then they're they're looking to make their money over time using cash flow and appreciation and depreciation and tax write-offs and all the benefits of owning real estate so they can get that you know you know cash on cash return that operating income that comes with all the benefits of owning real estate for sure but it would be cool if there was a list in place of people who are section eight landlords i I don't know. I, 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 just I, an bet, idea. I bet there is though. So let me, let me do some digging and I'll see what I can find out. And then I'll bring that back to next week's call because honestly, I mean, this is, that's literally a almost a 15% return. I mean, how many investors right now are hearing, Oh, I want 10% as what my cap rate is. 
This right. is 15. This is already checking that box. Figure out the underlying issue with the property. Figure out how long that tenant's in place for. Figure out what um, other issues, if any, there are. And from there, let's get to work. I mean, we could find people that would buy that. Even the fact that we don't have a database of Section 8 investors, we could find people that will go in and purchase this property all day long. Yeah, All day long. And I want to see somebody come back next week to the call saying, hey, Ryan and Benson, 151st Street, made 15K, made 10K. You guys can do that. And what Benson said too, just to kind of reiterate, we found a deal by trying to find a buyer first. That is the beauty of this. So where I think a lot of people go wrong is right here. What are we stuck at with this deal on 151st Street? We don't have a buyer. So that's the issue where if we went back and we were to realize that this agent that just sold this property might have a buyer too. The only thing that I would say is a, a note, this is situational awareness we talked about, is that in this case, they fix and flipped. So if this is more of a buy and hold investor, we would need to find a buy and hold investor. But in this case mm -hmm. too, we found a buyer first that's looking for fix and flips. We know that they can find deals super cheap at 27% of ARV. But more importantly, we know that they could go in. I think that they took a little bit of uh, some sweet time to go in and flip it, but that's okay. Um, they could go in and they're still buying properties to go in and fix and flip. So now we know what they're looking for. We can reverse engineer this into going and finding other opportunities that are already on market and start submitting offers on those. Let's look at the buyer on that one. If you go into the property history there in the bottom section, um, just scroll down there, property history. Yep. You can see there that the, the buyer, which we see as the seller now because the, the transaction closed, is Smartland Find, Find for, for LLC. LLC. Yep. So that's the buyer, you guys. This is the that reverse REI strategy. You find deals by finding the buyers because the buyer is going to tell you what they want. Mm -hmm. they're going to tell you what their buy box is. Now we, but we know they got this property, you know, really at a really good deal um, already, but is that what they would buy a property at in general? Well, no, you don't know for sure until you talk to them. Right. And then we would use the same approach that we just did to find the agent by just highlighting Smartland LLC, doing a quick Google search. We, they might, we might find their website. We might find their Facebook group. Likely we're going to, they're going to pop up in, you know, open corporates or some sort of a business database. And then we can go in, there it is, Smartland, find four. Fundraising, filing. Um, there they are right there. Yeah, this one right here. So then okay. you just look at their open corporates thing and you see that we've got, they've got four people here that are part of this company. Incorporator, I don't usually see that. Usually it's like an agent or a director. Yeah, yeah. And then you can take that name put it in true people search, do a quick search, and you're going to find oftentimes emails, phone numbers, and you can reach out and connect and ask them what their buy box is. And we'll do more training again down the road with Correct. what those conversations really look like. But right now we're just trying to give you a framework of what to expect and how to handle these things because it isn't all that hard. And right. what a lot of people do is they come into Privy and they're like, oh, I want to export a list of 10,000 buyers Mm -hmm. You don't need 10,000 buyers. You need like 10 or 20 good ones. That's it. I mean, that's literally how I started. My first quarter million dollar year was with five buyers and three of them were other wholesalers. One was buy and hold, one was fix and flip. So I always really emphasize that to people because if five buyers can make me $250,000, stop worrying about what all the gurus are telling you. You don't need to go and skip trace and pull an entire database and start cold calling and get VAs, and get all the systems in place. What you need to do is start submitting offers, calling agents, and understanding truly what the process is. So I love how you said reverse engineering the REI process. We just showed you guys, these are the people that are part of that entity. I mean, all of these are similar named companies. These are probably, if not the same people, someone that is probably associated with them or one of these partners already. You can go in and skip trace this LLC if you want to pay for one record to be skip traced or five on the day instead of 50,000. And you can understand, you could find this person generally pretty easily. So that's, I, I love that process, Benson. Yeah. And it makes it easy, right? Because when you reverse engineer the process, you're not creating your own path. When you blaze your own path, you make mistakes. Mm -hmm. you, you actually have to be a visionary and figure out the problems and solve them down the road. But when you start with the end in mind, with you, when you begin with the end in mind and you work backward, you're going down a path that someone else has already gone down. It's okay. already there. It's carved out. And it's really so much more simple for you to figure out what a winning strategy is because you're basing it off of someone else's success. They've Absolutely. already done it. This is what someone else has already done. All you got to do is just mirror that strategy, find something that matches what they're looking for, yep. 
and you got yourself a deal. Beautiful. And also too, just to make a note, this was listed on the 14th. It was under contract on the 19th. So you guys know that this property went quickly, meaning the area is hot with people that are looking to buy. This is someone that could have bought this property for 160,000 and still made this a rental. And if that section eight's bringing in 866 bucks a month, if this is bringing in a thousand bucks a month, I mean, this is still a pretty good rental, especially relative to some of these other markets. Like in Arizona, we're paying three fifty to four hundred thousand dollars still for single family homes to rent it out for anywhere from seventeen hundred to two thousand dollars a month. Our cap rate is extremely lower compared to some of these Midwest states. So mm -hmm. just be mindful that there's investors that are constantly out there looking to be buying more. So I love it. Love it. Love it. Absolutely. So what you would do, guys, is earlier I said to get out of your own way and, and get it out of your comfort zone with where you're looking for deals. The way that you do that is by looking at these closed deals and building your local market intelligence. When you research the, the like say the, like the last 10 to 20 closed deals in a specific market, mm -hmm. you'll really soon figure out what a deal is. You'll know what they're buying properties for, what they're selling them for. You're gonna know who the agents are that are investor focused. You're gonna know who the buyers are. You're gonna know what percentage of A or V they're buying at. I guarantee you that if you do that, you will know that market better than people that live there and are doing deals there. You absolutely right. will. And you could be way more effective by leveraging the data. You'll be way more prepared and strategic than somebody who's driving around looking at houses. Absolutely. I love that. Love it, love it. And also, I think we can all agree, I'd much rather be comfy in my own house than I would be driving around wasting gas, not even knowing what I'm looking at. Yes, if you guys wanted to go drive for dollars, there's nothing against that strategy. But I also want to challenge it just a little bit doesn't matter if you're pulling a list, doesn't matter if you're driving for dollars, door knocking, whatever. Do you honestly feel like you're the first person to go and knock on their door or to cold call them? And there's not anything wrong with being the 10th, 15th, 20th person. But if you can truly understand direct to seller, a lot of it is really luck of timing. Then it's going to be how good are your systems and processes and follow up. Third is how good's your data. Fourth is how good can you sell? You have a lot of things that have to go in your favor before we're even considering a deal going through. Versus what we're talking about is how many numbers can you get out of your head and make a phone call with every single day? How many offers can you submit? And sometimes it's not even you submitting the offers. It's the other agent doing it on your behalf. If you're an agent, I mean, I show you guys all day long how to go in and get all these deals and get the commission. But if you're an investor, just start making offers. Start making these calls. I promise you this isn't rocket science. I'm not the smartest guy even on this live right now. Benson's much smarter than me. Some of you guys in the comments, much smarter than me. I promise you guys, this is not that hard. It's just going in and taking action. It is taking action. And that's the other benefit of having, you know, working with an agent, that angle, when you're doing off market, you're responsible for the whole piece of it, unless you hire somebody to do it for you. Right. When you do on market, you either have a buyer's agent who's doing it all for you. And you, you basically have a business partner who's handling all the transaction coordination. They got your, your best interest in mind. They have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure you don't lose your earnest money to mm -hmm. make sure that once that property is under contract, it gets to closing. They're, they're talking to the buyers. They're doing the showings. They're opening the house up to do for the due diligence so that the buyers can do their inspection. They're doing all of that. And then what you, what are you doing? You're writing more offers on more deals. When you're doing off market, you're you're chasing buyers around. You are handling. You're babysitting the seller, and you want to make sure that they don't get cold feet. You want to make sure that they feel like they're involved in the transaction 100. I mean, I don't know how many times the horror stories I've heard where someone does a perfect transaction, and then somebody comes through and puts a little bit of doubt into the the, the seller's mind, the off market, yeah. and they don't show up at closing, yeah. or they sell that deal again. To somebody else and they've got two contracts i was just gonna say that and then then you're relying on oh can i go file a memorandum and there's all these other things that just like what i like is a handshake and i like people having um I, honestly i just call it integrity and you can't yeah. fault a seller because a lot of times oh, some of these wholesalers out there they're kind of gray and shady in my opinion you go out there and you get a deal under contract because you took advantage of grandma if grandma found out she could sell it for twice as much i don't blame grandma for doing so and that's where as agents we have all these what we call as tools on the tool belt you could walk in and say, hello, I could list your house for X price. Oh, you're trying to trade speed and convenience for price. I could actually be your investor and your client too, and I'll buy it from you. There's no commission. Oh, option three, there's no equity on the deal and we can't list it. How about we go creative? These are all different strategies that you can do and utilize. And I'm not telling you to get a real estate license. I'm just telling you that a real estate agent in your corner, if you aren't already one, is probably one of the most beneficial relationships you'll have in the entire industry. Yeah. 
and you guys don't put agents on a pedestal. Like I'm an agent. A lot of agents don't know better. Like most of them, in, in, especially in the investment world, don't because they they don't teach this stuff that we're showing you in real estate school, and they don't <laughs> usually teach it at Remax, right. right, or Keller Williams. Th these are going to be specialized agents that have found a niche, and they're kind of hard to find unless you're using Privy, and you can find them because we show you all those agents because they're attached to flips and fix and flip transactions. But don't put them on a pedestal. Like they want to make money, right? Mm -hmm. You have you're bringing something to the table. They want to sell properties. They need outlets. They need people to come to them. And when you come to them and you sound like you know what you're talking about, and you leverage say like a, a closed fix and flip that we have in Privy as an icebreaker as a conversation starter. And then you use, use that as kind of a, a bridge between you and them. Yep. Those conversations are simple. You guys, it just takes a little bit of practice to get out of your own head and feel that like you are actually bringing something valuable to the table. And then those conversations are great. And next thing you know, they're like, they're calling you and they want your advice and they want to work with you. And they're introducing you to other agents. Like it's crazy. Once you get out of your own way. Absolutely. And Benson, I know we're running out of time here. I think today what we should do is just kind of leave it at the showing people how we can find buyers. And next week, let's show them how we can go and find the active deals um, sure. and then maybe answer some questions. I know you guys have been putting some stuff in the chat. Um, somebody asked about agent investors. Um, I will put together a banner really fast and throw that across the screen. It's basically agentinvestors.com. Um, there it is. If you guys had any questions on our community and what we do on teaching this, this is agent investors. Um, I just want you guys to understand too. The point of this every Wednesday isn't to just bring people into our community or under the software. It's to provide value. At the end of the day, what we want you guys to do is if you're ready to go in and pay to learn from us and pay for the software, I always advise Privy before going into my program. My program is going to cost a little bit more money. But with Privy, the point of doing this every week is to show you guys that there's deals on market and there's people that buy on market. There is so much opportunity for every single one of us to go out there and succeed. And I think that we need to be better at just being louder and really just being vulnerable and sharing you guys some of the transparent stuff to this process. So let's get some of these questions answered. Um, I would love to be a resource for you guys and help out however we can. Whatever you guys need, feel free to ask. But um, I feel like today was a great start to this. I feel like we were able to show you guys how to find the buyers. And once you have the buyers, then it's just game on. I mean, again, we don't need 10,000 buyers, but if you had five buyers, six, seven buyers, and you had two of them were looking buy and hold, one of them's open to section eight. Here you go. Here's a deal. The other one's looking for rentals. Maybe it's that 160. Now you've got five that are fixing flippers. Depending on what percentage they buy at and how you can go and find the deals, that's where next week's call is going to be fun because we're going to show and show you guys how to go and make these calls ASAP and get some deals under contract and submit some offers. We had a couple of really good uh, questions here. Um, Absolutely. Matt asked, do you go after properties that are priced aggressively and new? Do you have any difficulty trying to assign? A contract that's close to list price um it, it really just depends M my favorite strategy is actually going for the new ones that are priced right aggressively because if if you have already built your buyers list and you know what your buyers want and you can get there and you can get there first and lock it up that's mm -hmm. the value you're bringing it isn't that you got it at a huge discount for some house that was sitting on the market for 60 90 days and now that buyer is thinking like, well, I have to get it at a huge discount. Nobody else wanted it. So yeah. for me to think it's a deal and feel comfortable, I need to get it at a big discount from the list price. When you get there first and you actually were able to, to beat everybody else, that's the value you brought. You've got Privy in your corner. You've got systems. You've got um, you know, Ryan's approach and, and, and my philosophies in the back of your, your mind working. That will help you get to the deal faster. Yep. analyze it quicker, make sure that you know that that house that is, that's a deal is next door to a house that was just flipped. And with all of those things in place, you get it under contract quickly. You can go and feel comfortable to a buyer and say, Hey, listen, you told me you wanted houses at 60% of the ARB. I got this one at 55%. Yep. Yeah. I had to pay $5,000 less. You're going to pay close to asking price, but it matches all your other deal criteria. The numbers make sense. There's many extra strategies. This is a deal. If you if you can get there first, and what you brought is that you have it under contract, and they don't, and no one else does, and they need that deal, that's what you're bringing, and, and you can get those done. Will you For have sure. some buyers that say, "Yeah, well, you know, I really want to get a discount." Well, there are lots of buyers that don't think that way. So Absolutely. Many buyers want just 
deal flow and they need to get deals done. There's an unlimited, I mean, there's a limited number of deals out there. Last night, Ryan, somebody asked this thing too, is like, well, why would they want to buy a property from you if they could have just gotten it themselves? <laughs> well, the answer is, well, they didn't get it themselves. Yep. You got it first. And I had this analogy. I think it's kind of funny. So over the weekend, the they had the Pro Bowl. Yep. And um, one of the, the things was they did a, uh, a, a dodgeball tournament. So there's yep. eight players and there's four balls in the middle. And when they click go, everybody runs out and grabs a ball. Well, guess what? There's four people that don't have balls. Mm -hmm. It's a simple supply and demand issue. So if everybody runs out and grabs a ball where well, there's four people that don't have balls, the only way that a person that doesn't have a ball gets a ball is if someone else throws it to them. This is the, the, what we're doing, you guys. You're racing to these and you're trying to get to those balls first. And then once you have it, you're, you're, you have the valuable piece of the game. I love if that. those other people want them, then yeah, you have to throw the ball to them. But th only if it makes sense. That makes so, sense. It's, it's a simple, it's simple supply and demand. I love that. And I think that that's a great analogy. And to show you guys like counterbalance, part of what I teach and what I go after primarily is deals that have been sitting. I found that if they are sitting on the MLS, I know how to communicate with an agent to the fact that if it's been sitting longer, I can ask them some of the harder questions. The point of it is that there is no wrong or right way to do it. The only, I guess there is a wrong way and it's by not doing either. So just understand you can go off of the day one on, on market listings. Um, I will tell you it also is dependent on the market where the Midwest and some of these other markets, if you can go day one and get it, phenomenal. What we found, especially in Arizona, is that there is a lot of competition with day one on market. And there's a lot of newer wholesalers that go and get properties under contract way higher than what any investor will truly pay for it. But if you have an investor that's willing to pay top dollar for it, or you know what percentage they're looking at, it's fair game. So I think that it's a great um, counterbalance there because I don't think that either way is wrong. Uh, just go out there and take action. I see Stacy actually went and called that um, agent on 151st, she said that uh, tenant is month to month and wants to say the property does have some roof issues and wants to wants close to asking. Um, the key word there is wants. So it's more of now, what do they need? Do they need this property to sell to go buy another house? Now, granted, we're talking about the landlord here. So the landlord, you got to figure out, do they like the section eight tenants? Because if they don't and they want the property gone, of course they want 70,000. But if you understand they just dropped it $15,000, that screams motivation to me, given that price point. And when you talk about roof issues, now you've got justification for a pretty big expense that is going to be on your table as the investor or on your end buyer's table if they're wholesaling it. So in this case too, I would still submit an offer. If they've gotten low ball offers, which I see your next comment, they've not accepted. This is where the hard question comes into the agent. I see the property has been sitting for 170 days. If this sits for another 170 days, what happens? I know what happens. The agent's going to lose the listing. The seller is going to be stuck with the tenants, and I don't know if they want them or not. And also, they're month to month. Anything could happen. There is no guarantee that they're going to get a paycheck for the next six months. There's a lot to unpack about that Section 8 tenant that I would want to get a little bit more information with, but also understanding the leverage as an investor, third month to month, 30-day notice gets that tenant out. So there's a lot to go into on that deal but I would still be submitting that offer and I'd go after it probably around $45,000, $50,000 at most. Amazing. Love it. love it, I love it. Yeah, some people are asking about like how do you talk to agents and how do you talk to buyers? You guys, we wanted to give you guys a good foundation understanding of what we're going to be doing and what's next. So yep. in following calls, we are going to be talking to, to agents live. We'll be talking about strategies, about talking to agents. Um, that's all going to come from, from Ryan because that's what he's a professional at. Um, buyers as well. We've got some, probably some scripts that we can give away so we can help people with that. And then for those of you who don't have Privy, um, you need to get it. Like what we're showing you here is the easiest path to getting deals done consistently, predictably, and also giving you the ability to scale and do business. So, um, Ryan, do you have a link for that? Yes, absolutely. I just put it together. It is creative. Yeah, if you guys go in there and, and get, go ahead there and get started. We have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Uh, Privy is only $97 a month, you guys, if you don't have it yet. Guys, this is definitely the best software out there. 
Um, you guys will see I do not associate with others because there really isn't anything else out there that compares to Privy. Um, this is the best of the best. This is what I use day in, day out. Um, that's why we're starting to go live because I want to show you guys how we use this. This was actually my very first time inside the Cleveland market. So if you guys could tell why I'm a little bit like, I don't know. Um, the beauty of this is that we're going to learn together. I'm going to go in and I'm going to help you guys build out your buyers list. I'm going to help you build out your agent list. And I'm going to help you guys submit some offers. I'm going to tell you guys what I would submit on it. I'd help you guys sell it. We have a Discord community where we have buyers that are actually going in and purchasing deals from other wholesalers in our community. Um, but the goal here is to collaborate and more importantly, get some deals done. And then if you guys want, let's get privy. Jump in agent investors. Let's work together and collaborate. That's the beauty of all this is uh, collaboration. Yep. And if you use the promo code Zolin, Z-O-L-I-N, I'll give you 20% off your first month. Dang. That's insane. So 77 bucks. Um, and then you got a 30 day money back guarantee you guys. And if uh, and a little tough love here, we've thousands of people that are doing exactly what we showed you today with success. So if you get in there, you're not having success. You got to look at yourself in the mirror, right? Really look at yourself in the mirror. And if there's something stopping you from like doing the things that work, if you get stuck in your own, my market, or if you're only focused on the cold calling and the skip tracing it, if you can figure out the formula for a successful return on investment on doing off-market deals, we'll do it. But here's what I've, I've found is when people who are successful with off-market start doing on-market and they know how simple it is, mm -hmm. they make that a bigger part of their business. Absolutely. Because it's a way better return on investment. I love it. I love it. I love it. Awesome, Benson. Well, I appreciate you. I'm looking forward to doing this weekly with everybody. And uh, hopefully we will see you guys next week. If you guys got some value from this, feel free to like and subscribe to the channels. Uh, put on your notifications. Look at us. I'm like such a YouTuber now. This is so crazy. Uh, <laughs> but I appreciate you guys. And I will see yeah. you guys. Um, go ahead, Benson. What's up? One more thing. I just want to yeah. say, if you guys have questions, you can call our office. Beautiful. Um, the office number is 844 uh, 844- four three eight seven seven four eight and people uh we've got you know amazing staff there that can answer your questions about pricing and, and you know questions you might have or you can email support at team privy dot com okay i love it i love it i love it i appreciate you guys and we will see you guys next week all right guys bye